It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Brigadier General Retired Zvika Chaimovich, who served as the Chief Commander of the Israeli Air Defense Forces from 2015 to 2018. General Chaimovich joined the IAF in 1985. During his service, he had several positions, including Commander in Charge of the Command Field of the IAF Air Defense School, Head of Training Branch in the IAF Air Defense Division, the Commander of the Active Defense Wing, and Commander of the Sky Defense Wing. Today, General Chaimovich is a contributing expert at the Miriam Institute, specializing as an author, lecturer, and researcher on behalf of the organization, which convenes lectures on Israeli national security and defense policy by senior members of the Israeli defense establishment. They do so on campuses and for elected officials throughout the English-speaking world. They also have an online commentary section that is a leading platform for Israel-focused discussion, dialogue, and debate. In conversation with General Chaimovich is Benjamin Anthony, co-founder of the Miriam Institute. We are particularly delighted to welcome his colleague and co-founder of the organization, Rosita Panini, who is here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you Brigadier General Retired Zvika Chaimovich and Mr. Benjamin Anthony of the Miriam Institute. <laughs> So uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, cadets, uh, members of the US Air Force Military Academy, we're delighted and honored to be here. We thank all of you for your hospitality and the way you've welcomed us uh, here at your incredible facility. Um, I, I want to uh, also express my profound acknowledgement and thanks. At the back, you may have seen me waving. I'm not being a politician. I actually know a number of people. We had the privilege of bringing some of your cadets to the State of Israel for a two-week tour. They're here with us today. We thank you uh, so very much for being with us. We feel uh, encouraged and challenged at the same time. And actually, this is an outgrowth of, of that trip. So thank you so very much for giving uh, of your time today. I'm going to interview General Haimovic. He's given me permission to play around a little bit uh, with the questions. So we're going to break the mold somewhat. Uh, but it's all with a view to us learning from the expertise of this individual. So. Some of you may be aware General Chaimovich is the immediate past chief commander of the Israel Air Defense Forces. So if you've heard of the Iron Dome system, if you've heard of the Arrow system, if you've heard of the David Sling system, this is the individual who was in charge of the deployment of those systems and I believe bringing them operational. But I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about his operational experience because it's one thing to be the commander of the Air Defense Forces in certain places in the world. It's another thing to be the commander of the Air Defense Forces in the State of Israel because of the immediacy of the threats. So I'd like you just to explain to this learned audience some of the threats. Maybe you can go Gaza, Syria, Lebanon, and then afterwards you can broaden it out because I know that you're very strategically minded. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's really uh, my pleasure to uh, share with you this morning, as it was uh, yesterday, my experience, my life experience, uh, mostly about uh, leadership, but uh, always uh, Benjamin tried to challenge me and ask me some more than leadership, and it's great because I think you are great guys to take my ideas or my experience or my knowledge and I would be more than happy to share it with you. So I prefer not talk about my, my job or my challenges uh, as the Air Defense Forces Commander in Israel and I'll take you for a short uh, tour with the challenges that Israel faced in the last 10, 15 years and then you will decide by yourself what does it mean to be the Israeli Air Defense Forces Commander. So we'll take only the last 15 years. It's not so much, but it's enough to emphasize and understand what I'm talking about and what we'll talk about it later. Israel is a state, and I'm not familiar from other states all over the world. You will correct me if I'm wrong, hopefully not. But we are the only state all over the world that in less than 15 years to be more precise, since 2006, July 2006. I don't know if anybody here knows what happened in Israel in July 2006. It was the second Lebanon war. So we'll take that milestone from 2006 to 2020. More than 20,000, this is the number, 
I'm not wrong, 20,000 rockets, missiles, and mortars, you name it, were launched to the state of Israel for multi-front, multi-directionals. North from Lebanon and Syria by Hezbollah, Syria, and Iranian militias groups, from Hamas, from Gaza in the south, from ISIS, Sinai, Egypt, and more. More than 20,000 rockets. I'm sure that you cannot compare it for any other states that you are familiar, traveled, or living in. We are talking a, a lot of conflicts, crises, wars. Just to describe what does it mean, conflict, war, or crisis in Israel. And I'll do it very briefly, very, very shortly, and take three main events. I mentioned the Second Lebanon War, more than 30 years, 30 days, sorry, of daily conflict, war, around 4,000 rockets. I will jump to 2011, the pillar of defense, only seven days, 1,500 rockets. Less than three years after, 2014, when I was the active defense wing commander, 51 days, around 5,000 rockets, 75% of the Israeli civilian under daily attacks. We are sitting in a very nice room, very nice environment and weather outside. Try to take yourself back on the time to this environment that I'm sharing with you. So what does it mean to be the Israeli Air Defense Forces commander? Be responsible for all that stuff. For a national perspective, protect your state, protect your people. This is your mission. To minimize the damage from lower tier motor rockets up to lower tier long range missiles from Iran. And at the same time, the ABTs, the air briefing targets, UAVs, jets, choppers, etc. During my uh, position as the Air Force Commander, we intercepted, for example, five Iranians and Syrians UAVs that were flew to the State of Israel. And one Sukhoi 20, 24 Syrian jet that crossed the border. So it's not only the active, what we call the active, the TBN, tactical ballistic missiles and, and rockets. So it's a variety, big spectrum of threats and we will talk about the dynamic, the environment that we are facing with. But this is the meaning of being the Air Defense Forces commander in Israel in that time. If somebody wants to be in this position, maybe two, three years from today, it will be relevant, but that's, that's the way that we are doing the professional, operational, business or missions in very intensity environment in Israel, talking about my previous job and our very complicated situation. I want to ask you one more question about that and then we'll come to the, the dynamic of leadership so people can see how you've implemented your practical challenges into not only leading but building the next generation of leaders that's so very relevant. I want to well, I probably shouldn't say this, but while we were on the tour in Israel, the cadets were paddling in the Sea of uh, Galilee on one particular morning, and a projectile was fired at right over it. There was a drone coming in from Syria, and we, saw, right, and we saw the detonation right over uh, where we were. So uh, thank you for keeping us safe, uh, even as we <laughs> swam in, uh, in well, the sea. For, especially thank for you. Thank you. <laughs> a wonderful live demonstration. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the qualitative military edge, just for a moment. Uh, so you talked about 2006 rockets from Lebanon fired by Hezbollah, 2012 rockets from Gaza fired by Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and again 2014. But they're now in possession of GPS uh, technology that is changing the game in terms of the accuracy of these and really increasing the ferocity of the cat and mouse uh, race that's at play. Can you talk a bit about that and what are they trying to hit? It's, mu it's much complicated than, than it looks, because we are in a race between 
us and the other sites. And unfortunately, there are sites. It means more than one site. They are all leading and monitoring by Iran, but there are much more than sites, and we need to respect our enemies. I think this is rule number one as the military leaders. We need to respect our enemies. They are doing the same process as us. They are learning. They are doing the ARs exactly as we are doing after every event, every conflict. And in this race, we need always to be one step before our enemies. If not, we will lose the next conflict. And I can see, and I saw it before, but I say it today, very, very clear the way that our enemies learning exactly and try to learn where our gaps, how to challenge our systems, our weapons, our concept, our doctrine. The question is, is focused on one topic, very important, very critical, but this is not the only one. I'll give you another one, for example. I saw in the last 10 years that I mentioned before, they started and they launched single targets, single rockets and missiles. And we saw, thanks to the process that I'll talk about it later on, how they are improving the way that they are working. And I'll jump 10 years ahead. If we started 10 years ago with one single target, rockets, mortars, missiles, you name it, less than 10 years after, the biggest salvo. Biggest salvo, it means simultaneously a lot of targets on the air, more than 60. Try to think and put yourself in the BMC, in the Battle Management Command, sitting, and you can see, fly to your face, a package with 60 simultaneously missiles. And you need, as a commander, as a soldier, to take a decision and deal simultaneously with 60 rockets that's going to hit or attack your mission. Another issue was the question that I was asked. They saw, and I will not repeat again all the numbers, but they saw that it's not enough to bring thousands of missiles and rockets to the state of Israel, because the question of damage, it was non-effective. So they understood it's not enough to bring statistic, a big amount of numbers to the state of Israel and create almost zero damage. And they started strategic decision to move, to develop precisive missiles with a huge warhead. Now try to imagine that this target missile rocket with a 100 kilo and more warhead will be precisive in less than 10 meter going to attack, for example, this building. Not by mistake. And they are still in, in thanks, thanks God and thanks to our forces, they are still in this process and didn't reach the goal that they want to because we attack, delay, prevent, and more them to achieve all that capabilities. But that will change dramatically the situation, and we need to prepare ourselves. We don't want that all the thousands of rockets that Hezbollah, Hamas, and the other groups holding today will be precisive stuff. And then each target have a specific address where to go, where to attack. It will be a game changer to our concept, strategy, and the state of Israel. And so, so this, these are some of the threats <clears throat> that are faced by yourself and those in your team. And that's why it's so very vital to be able to create leadership and decision making and anticipation and reaction all in the same individual. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Iron Dome system, just as one example, which is effectively the ability to shoot one bullet down with another bullet is actually 
a system that could be fully automated, but it keeps the man in the loop. You've told me about that. And I think that that really expresses why you've had to diligently build leadership within the forces that you command. So can you just tell us a little bit, turning to the slide, what it is that you're going to share with us today? Yeah, I think it's part of our concept, but it's part of our culture in, in the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, the Israel Air Forces, and of course the Air Defense uh, Forces. We are working and using state-of-the-art technology, R really. Uh, you cannot find better than that systems. It's kind of a science fiction that you will take a very speed, high velocity of a target and will intercept or engage with a, a missile from, from the ground. It, it's really, 10 years ago, it was science fiction just to think about it, how, how does it work? And all of them have a full automatic mode. I'll tell you a secret. We are not working with that mode. Because we trust our people much more than the system. It looks very strange. But the system, and it doesn't matter how smart is the system, it's only a system. It's a formula. Computer, one plus one equals two. But in our life, in our dynamic environment and threats, sometimes one plus one equals three. And only men online in the loop can make it. Because system, you can operate and say, OK, you will take the decision after five seconds, or seven, you name it. But what happens if a minute, a millisecond, minute in our time, it's like a cigarette break in, in your time. A second after, the target changed the direction and become relevant. But the system took the decision because you operated to five seconds. Only men, smart, sharp, well-educated, well-trained, can take online decisions. Talking about online, I want to bring you inside the decision-maker place. What does it mean online? Missile from Gaza to one of our big cities in the south part of Israel, which is called Ashkelon. Only 10 miles from Gaza. They are launching a lot of rockets from Gaza to that city. Also to Tel Aviv and others. But let's take Ashkelon, 10 miles. The time flight from launching till eating. Try to guess. It's early in the morning. I'll help you. I'll help you. <laughs> 15 seconds. One five. It's a lot of time, right? <clears throat> right. But 15 seconds is from launching to eating. The time frame to engage and take the decision, it's only five seconds. So each one of you will count yourself five seconds. This is the reaction time that you need to understand, decide, and take the decision. Of course, far away targets, you have much more time. Much more time in our mission, it's up to 30 seconds, no more. So in 30 seconds, and I'm talking for the young future leaders, 30 seconds, five, to, five seconds to 30 seconds, you don't have time, call to your boss, call to your chief, call to your mentor, call your name it. You need to take decision by yourself. This is the way that we are working. And I'm proud that our people, commanders, fighters, soldiers, they are much more smarter than the system. Of course, the system help them, support them, bring them the tools to take the right and the correct decision. But it's integrated with the man in the loop. It's not only a system decision.
Hopefully it will answer to your question. Absolutely. So, so, so you always keep the, the women and men within the system making those decisions. Absolutely. You've obviously imbued them with this ability to make those decisions. We've got about 15 minutes, 20 minutes to talk through how you did that. Give us a little bit of an overview of how you, how you make sure that we've got the right people in the right place at the right time. So first of all, we are here to talk about leadership. This is the, the title or the, the topic of the very important uh, symposium here. And talking about leadership, and you can see only an example of definitions. If you open the books and essays, you will find dozens of definitions. It doesn't mean that they are correct or incorrect definitions. I think that leadership is much more than definition. It's mentality skills, performance, ideas. And in front of my short briefing about leadership, if I may, don't forget to bring your personality, your values, your way to your leadership position and time. Don't follow the others because the others are doing like that. Always there is a huge space and place for your personality, values, and unbelieved way to your leadership. And I'll try in the next few minutes share with you my life experience about leadership with a few examples. And I'm sure that now you have a better understanding about the environment and the situation in Israel. So how you build your skills, you build your leadership to be effective and efficient in this kind of environment. But talking about leadership, it's not a general discussion. I think we need, first of all, to understand the situation and the environment that we are part of that. Because leadership, it's not automatic mode, and we mentioned the automatic mode. I dislike that mode. It's not reading the book, bring the definition, plug it, play, and run. We need to understand, if we want to be relevant, effective, and efficient leaders, we need to understand, excellent, the situation, the environment. And you are going to lead in a very ambitious environment. I put only one slide. We can spend, believe me, seminars and hours to explain you what does it mean. I put only one slide that describes, I'll help you because it's in a small letter, the conflicts all over the world. So the colors describe the intensity of the conflicts. So it doesn't matter if it's a better or worse. The idea that we are living in a very dynamic environment. It wasn't like that when I was young captain or young lieutenant. You will jump to this world. This world changing a lot. Focus on the security and the defense perspective. We have the superpowers. We have radical states. They are here. They will stay with us. But the transformation that we are part of this process and it's ongoing process, we are moving from big wars to conflicts all over the world, not only in the Middle East. Less states against states, more states against organizations, terror and guerrilla organizations. You can see here example flags of part of them. from global conflicts to local conflicts with a global effect. It's a huge difference. All of you need to think about that environment that you are going to act and work in this environment. So it's all in change, moving. If you are looking for the stability, you are in the incorrect job. 
in quel job, looking for another job. And if I try to, to make it more clear for you, and try to compare, I'm sure that you're familiar with the background, but maybe less with the bullets in front. The left hand side is the old world, the old era, 10, 15 years ago, when I was a young commander. It was all very clear. Stability, our comfort zone, we sat and felt excellent. Today, it's not like that. You need to react in ongoing change. You need to take a decision in unfamiliar expertise because it's all changing. Very dynamic environment. This is the area, this is the situation, this is the region that you are going to work. And it doesn't matter if it's the Middle East, Asia, Africa, you name it. All the regions have the same ideas. So once you will understand and describe for yourself the meaning of the environment, then we can talk about leadership and about the leadership skills that will be relevant dealing with that environment. Because talking about leadership out of the book with no context to the situation, it will be less relevant or non-relevant, you name it. And I prefer to be effective and efficient. And I believe this is the right and the correct way talking about leadership. First of all, understand the platform, the base, the situation, the environment, and then let's talk who is the leader that we want dealing with that environment. So can you give us some examples of the leadership skills, the specifics that are needed today? And also, I'd like you to speak about your own standard of self-assessment that you constantly, constantly looked back to once you made the decision that you wanted to be the commander of the Air Defense Forces when you were a young battalion commander. Yeah. Uh, Actually, there are two or three different questions, but they are all well, well connected. Who are the leaders that we want that will deal with this very complicated and very challenged mm -hmm. situation that we are talking uh, about? First of all, it should be flex enough to update it to keep his mind open and ready for changes. We'll talk in a while about changes, because we like to talk about changes, but let's see if we are really doing the changes as a leader. We need to build and bring ourselves in a constant circle to learn to think and take a decision. This is all about leadership, decision making. And if we are talking about a very complicated dynamic environment, I'm asking you looking for the changes. Build the mechanism with yourself and your troops and ask yourself always, where are the changes? Behind each one of the change, you will find a chance. But it's not so simple. Because each one of the chances have risks, opportunities. In a perfect world, only opportunities. But we are not in perfect world. That's the life. So if you can choose your job, you can not choose your life. That's the life. Come together. But you need to understand it, to analyze it, and then work. And we are working, and we are taking a decision. 
I use a lot these three self-test questions. Don't wait for your boss or your commander that he will tell you and give you a feedback. A, great. A, A plus, A minus. You will promote to whatever you want. Be your own boss. I cannot tell you every week, every two weeks. You know exactly when and where. But ask yourself three questions. <coughs> Am I achieving my goals? The first question. Because we are all dedicated and focusing to achieve goals. This is all about military and leaders. We are focusing, achieving targets, missions, goals. The second question that you need to ask yourself, watching back on the way, what was correct, what was incorrect, how can I do it better? And last but not least, I told you before, remember, bring your personality, values, your own way. Ask yourself about the way that you passed or took. Am I believe in my way? All these three questions will help you to define yourself and not waiting for your boss or your command if you are in the correct way in your leadership, in your decision making. And you asked me about my, my own experience, so assessments. And yeah. And here is a few examples from my own experience. I used it when I was a commander in this environment. And you can take it or leave it or bring in other tools. That's fine, but just think about it. Think about the tools that you want to build and bring to yourself to your troops dealing in this environment. First of all, a learning forum. I remember myself, took my trade doc commander and asked him to build a few learning teams. And I told him, don't tell me stories. First of all, I don't have time. Second, and much more important, it's less effective. I want that the learning teams will bring me changes. They will focus on doctrine, technology, systems, enemies, bring me changes. And then it's not enough, okay? I understand where are the changes, so what? What we are doing with that changes? We build doctrine teams that they checked and compared between the currently concept and doctrine to the changes. And believe me, change a lot. Because if you will not change, you will create a gap, a gap, a gap, and you will not fill the gap with concept, with doctrine, with new methods, you will prepare yourself to the previous conflict and not for the future conflict. You will not reach, you will not find your enemies because they are not there, they are changed. Another tool, how to train and educate your people. The schools, and we are in school, so I apologize in advance for the staff or the faculty, they don't like to change the syllabus and the programs. I remember my school, my school commander when I was there, defense was commander. He always told me about his challenges, change the program. I told him, okay, great. I'm very happy. So what? Do you want to keep your syllabus? And then right after they will graduate, you go to the field and they will find what? Something new. That's a problem. So 
sorry about the faculty that's sitting there. That's the end of our <laughs> session, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. <coughs> yeah. How to build effective program to your people. How to build the exercises and the training. They should be relevant, not a general, realistic scenarios that they will fit exactly the changes that your learning team brought and they will practice the new doctrine. Otherwise, they will find it the first time on the field. You don't want it. And always, I told to my exercise planners, bring realistic scenarios, but always bring surprises to the operators. Why? From my experience, I never, never saw a conflict, a crisis, a military I'm talking about, yeah? with zero surprises. So you need to train your people how to take a decision. I just a few slides ago talked about the unfamiliar environment and tech decision out of your expertise. This is the way to practice your people, to take decision exactly to be relevant in that environment. Mm -hmm. And here is the link between the ideas. And last example, a method that I used a lot, it's called assessment. I build a few assessment teams, operational systems, it means weapons, missiles, etc. threat, personal. A lot of changes from ourselves. Just compare the generation that we are part of that. The why, the Z, we cannot ignore them. We need to understand what does it mean. Because each one of that pillars brings something new to the field. And if we will not understand, we will not prepare ourselves, we will be less effective in the field. So, four or five tools or methods that I'm sharing with you, that you can Use it tomorrow in your, in your job, in your position. This is, was my experience. I found it very effective, so that's the reason why I'm sharing it with you. So we've got time for just two more quick questions before we open it to the audience. The time is running. Well, it is, but, uh, but that such is the nature of this. Time is a cruel master, as you know, uh, <laughs> with your five seconds and so forth. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you, can you just give us, uh, I'd like to ask you to do this briefly because I, I, I want to give you a chance to, to, to engage with this audience. I think they'd, they'd be very, very um, uh, blessed to do that. And we'd be fortunate to learn from them by way of their questions as well. Give us a, a real-time example from the Middle East that shows how to read a situation with accuracy and, and how to implement leadership. Briefly, I'm sorry if it's a heavy question, but, and then we'll, we'll move well, on to the last one. <coughs> it will take time. Okay. It will be briefly, but it will take time, because it, it, it's really, it's an excellent question. And we can talk a lot about it, but I'll try to, to do it really very, very brief, just to, to give you an idea of how to take complicated <laughs> currently situation and have a better understanding from stories and try to make a link and then have a better understanding and not just reading news in the media or the newspaper because all the idea is not to know, it's to understand. And always we need to find where is the starting point. It could be a week ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. Depends how complicated or what the event or the situation or the story that we are talking about. Most of the stories have a long line back, so we need to find that beginning point to have a better understanding of what we are dealing with. And I, I'm sure that, for example, in the Middle East, 
you are all familiar with Iran, ISIS, Hezbollah, civil war in Syria, the Arab war, the Sunnah, the Shia, really big mess. Big mess, believe me. I'm living there, it's a big mess. But we need to understand that puzzle. That puzzle, it's a picture with many, many pieces. Each one of the pieces, it's very important. By itself, it's less important. The idea is to bring the pieces and build one clear picture. This is the idea in complicated situation. And Middle East is a great example of complicated situation. And if I try to bring all that stories, titles, and, and links together, and try to show you a way how to understand a complicated situation, through a lot of question remarks, because the question remarks will lead you for a better understanding. You will not take it as a story from the CNN or the Fox. You need to understand why. And if you will understand why, you can be relevant dealing with that environment. Because just reading a story, it's good in your free time. And talking about the Middle East, there are three main pillars that they are all about. And if you will understand them, we understand all the stories that they will be part of that pillars. First of all, we are talking about the civil war in Syria, more than eight years. So it started as an initial issue. But very fast, it's become a global issue. We found one day, really out of the blue, with zero alert, October 2015, thousands of Russian troops in Syria. They are still there. So, you know, it's a break news, an intel message. Okay. Did you ask yourself ever why President Putin decided to deploy thousands of Russian troops to Syria? It means that you are still asking yourself. I'll help you. Russia left the podium as a superpower 15, around 15 years ago. President Putin decided, strategic decision, to stand again as a superpower in the world. And Syria, he decided, will be a gate to the world. And for that time, we found him against US policy or ideas in Turkey, in Kurds, Iran, and other places. So it's not about Syria. It's about the way that he took Syria as a great opportunity to bring himself to the center of the stage next to the United States of America. America is a superpower. And right after, we found Iran and Hezbollah part of his coalition. Very strange coalition. Remember one of the previous slides? Local conflict affect global. Great example. <laughs> Great example, it's not about Syria. And I do it very fast, sorry. I apologize. I do, no. <coughs> second pillar, Iran. Every second break news, Iran in the media. So what are we talking about Iran? First of all, the most radical state, I would say, terror state all over the world. But it's not only that. We need to understand the way, the ideas, the concept that they are working. And then we can deal with them. We need to go 10 years back. We can go further, but let's start in 2010. What's happened there? Do you know? A lot of things in the Middle East. December 2010. Later on, we called it the Arab Spring. Tunisia, 
revolution. Less than two years from that point, December 10, two revolutions in Egypt, two in Yemen, started the civil war in Syria, Iraq, of course, it's ongoing, and more. It means the Arab world will not be the same as it was before 2010. Iran understood that, and they decided to lead the Arab world. So if we want to understand what is leading today the Iranian regime and leaders today, we need to go back 10 years. They decided to lead the Muslims, the Arab world, because from that point, the Arab world divided for two parts, the Shia and the Sunnah. And they decided to lead, first of all, the Shia, and then the rest of the Arab world. And they decided to use a lot of proxies in the area, kind of a front ends. Look at the location. Imagine a map in front of you. The Houthis in Yemen, in the south, the militia in Iraq, Hezbollah, ISIS, Lebanon, Syria, and look at that end, control all the Middle East. Mm -hmm. This is the idea. So talking about that, you can talk about, OK, each one of the proxies and describe them. But we need to understand the global picture about Iran. Nevertheless, Iran running last minute was the same time that I'm talking 10, 15 years ago, two ambitious programs. And they didn't stop for a second. First of all, long-range missile program. They want to reach 5,000 kilometer missile. Why? Israel, it's only 1,500. Today they have 2,000 kilometer capabilities of missiles. Why they need 5,000? Why? Again, take the map, put the 5,000 kilometer, we find most of Europe, all of the US bases, west and east, and here we go. But it's not enough. They have a second ambitious program, the nuclear program. Why that radical regime need a nuclear program? How many Arab states holding today a nuclear capability? How many? Help me, I'm counting. Zero. Remember, 10 years ago, they decided to lead the Arab war. So they understood that that tool will help them in the Arab world, but in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping to the last pillar. What time? Or we have to be very quick, because I must take questions from this audience. But, but please do summarize. I think there would be a benefit. It will be very quick. Yeah. So the last <coughs> one is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So the civil war in Syria, Iran, and the Israeli conflict, those are the three pillars that's leading the understanding about the situation. And then, OK, how we can be effective dealing with that. A lot of ups and downs in this conflict. I'll not talk about it. A lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, risk. But again, to understand, go back and jump now to understand the situation. So we are dealing or conflict with the Palestinians more than 100 years. I'll not take you back 100 years. Only 13 years. What happened? Summer 2007. Hamas took the control in Gaza. From that point, there is no one Palestinian voice. There is no one Palestinian authority. And we are still talking about the Palestinians as a one body. It is a mistake for understanding, because there is no one Palestinian body. Hamas in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, there are two different authorities. <coughs> Believe me. They are enemies like, or they like each other the same day they like Israel. It means they are dislike each other. 
I'm going to move to the floor for the questions because I, 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 we have five minutes. It and, means and that I we promise. need to stop. No, 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 we don't need to stop, but rather, first of all, you'll be around for informal questions afterwards as well, but uh, can we take questions from okay. the audience and we're going to bundle the questions, so if I can have, by show of hands, uh, if that's okay, does anybody have a question? If not, we can continue. If not, we can carry on, but, but I, be, I would imagine someone does. Yes, please. <coughs> Morning, sir. C3C Laraca. So my question is, can you elaborate on the decision-making process you went through when he had to retaliate against groups like Hamas, but they would base like their operations like near civilian centers like hospitals? Good. Now, just before you answer that, I want to deal with something, because if I don't get it done, I'll never be able to forgive myself. Where's that amazing photographer who was roaming around before? Is he still in the room? Is there a photographer in the room? The photographer? Okay, the best shot that we would like is from behind the general looking out at this esteemed audience, and I think that would be wonderful. So with that, you answer the question, please. I know what I'm doing in terms of photographs, and please, if you would answer that. <laughs> Trust me. What was, what was the question? <laughs> Go for it. No, 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 you don't look around. Just speak. <laughs> never, never somebody stood behind me. That's a... Go for it. Uh, Thank you. The back, of, the back of your head looks great. Carry on. Uh, a great question, really. A great question. I think it emphasized, and I'll take your question and, and bring it in a bigger perspective. It emphasized the asymmetrical warfare. This is part of the complicated situation that we are dealing with the organization and not states. States against states, they are keeping same rules, values. But we are talking about organizations. We are not playing with the same values. <coughs> I mentioned before the 20,000 rockets. They want to hit schools, neighborhoods, shopping centers, hospitals, etc. The Hamas and the Hezbollah using backyard schools as a launcher sites. Basically, the underground floors in hospitals, they are for parking lots, right? In Shifa, this is the biggest hospital in Gaza, they are using the underground floor for the Hamas leaders' bunkers. Normally, mosques or synagogues, chapels, they are holy places to people to come in. In Gaza, it's a big storage for missiles and rockets. Do you know why? Because they know that we will not attack that places. This is a great example to emphasize the asymmetrical warfare. And we will do whatever we can to prevent any innocent, even though they are using that facilities to attack our people, our state. So we need to take a brave decision. And again, I told you before, keep your values, keep your personality. Maybe you will lose that engagement next minute, but we will win much more than that. We will reach, believe me, that terrorist groups. Not in the mosque, <coughs> not in the hospital, not in the school. An hour later, they, they know it. But this is the way. We cannot lose our values, our way. We don't want to be like the terror and the guerrilla groups. That will keep us different than the other. This is a new challenge. Remember, states dealing with uh, non-state organizations, terror and guerrilla organizations. Thank you. Difficult life. Thank you. Do we have time for one last Question. One, one more question we can take if it's brief. Yes, sir. There's a gentleman at the front here, the second row. This, this gentleman. <clears throat> Good morning, sir. Uh, Cadet Candidate Lickert. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about some of the challenges you faced in implementing a system as comprehensive as the Iron Dome? Uh, maybe as far as like training individuals to use a system, it seems like such a shift in paradigm for uh, the Israeli defense. I just would like to know some of the challenges that you faced. 
And unfortunately, we only have one minute for that, General. So <laughs> these questions, you see, people, people want to, to engage. So we'll, we'll be around as well afterwards, definitely. Please. I'll tell you, and I'll take the Iron Dome, because you asked as an example. Iron Dome, personally, since uh, 2011, OK? April 7th, that was the first time. It was Thursday, 6 p.m., 6 and 15 minutes. That was the exact time. I remember it like it was yesterday. For that time, we are talking about less than 10 years. Except the name, Iron Dome, the rest of the system, different. Different. We took as advantage all that crisis and conflict and changed a lot the system to be relevant because the enemies changed the same. Dealing with salvos, dealing with multidirectional threats, dealing with more capacity simultaneously targets, working well integrated with David Sling and Arrow. We don't want to stand alone. We started as a standalone. Today, it's a full integrated environment. So it affects much more than just only the system. We need to take the chances <coughs> from bad events like crisis and conflicts and push it down to the concepts, to the doctrine, to the systems, and updated too. And it's affect not only the Air Force, it affects all the Israel Defense Forces because it's a way to think about the mix between offensive capabilities and defense capabilities. They are working together because today we understand that offensive capabilities cannot exist without defense capabilities. We didn't think it before. The defense capabilities bring the leaders the buffer time and zone to take a rational decision about the offensive, maneuvering, and other. So they're well coordinated. So it, it is working much bigger than just focus on the system itself. Thank you very much. I just want to, before I turn it back to you, I have to say something because it, 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 it's on behalf of all of us and on behalf of the people of Israel. We are members of the Jewish faith in the Jewish state. And many of us were ingathered after the horrors of the Holocaust. And the individuals, the aviators, who flew in the defense of all that is virtuous in this world were wearing the uniforms that you will one day be wearing. And there is a deep and well-founded connection between our country and your country. We thank you. It's not the only occasion you did the same thing in the Yom Kippur War, where you came to our aid, where we were very much embattled. And I just want you to know that, that as you heard from the general, we face endless challenges, but if you give the Jewish people half a chance in this world, they will go out and build you an Israel. And from the soils of Israel spring leaders such as the general. That is the result of an ingathering of a people and to its land, and the reconciliation of a land with its people. And so we are extremely grateful to you, and you made a right decision uh, when you decided to take a bet on the future of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. And I want to also applaud our cadets, because I don't know if I'll have the opportunity to do so, Cadet Flash and Cadet Sofa. Thank you so very much for being with us. You've been remarkable. And with that, I thank you, General Chaimovic, as well. And I turn it back to you, Cadet, cadet Flash. <laughs> General Chaibovich and Mr. Anthony, thank you so much for your time and your words today. <clears throat> On behalf of our 2020 NCLS participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty and staff of the Air Force Academy, we'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Once again, we would like to extend our thanks to the class of 1959 our flagship supporter, the class of 1973, the class of 1974, the class of 1993, 
the Association of Graduates, the Air Force Academy Foundation, the Falcon Foundation, the John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation, Earl Enix, class of 1977, and Mrs. Candy Enix, and all others who, through their generosity, make NCLS possible. We would appreciate your continued feedback on this year's NCLS. Please take a few minutes to fill out the survey, which can be found on the NCLS app. If you've not done so already, we encourage you to download and use the NCLS app and continue to connect with us via social media. This concludes the session. Thank you.